very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in the Lee Kong Chen Research Fellowship Sharing Session. We are honored to have all of you here and hope you will have an enjoyable evening with us. Well, this evening's sharing, we have Dr. Mustafa Izzuddin, a Senior Analyst in International Affairs with Solaris Strategy Singapore and an adjunct Senior Lecturer at the National University of Singapore. Dr. Mustafa will map the nautical journey of the Gujaratis and present findings from his study of the community's evolution in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia from 1850 to 2020 through three interconnected networks, business and trade, sports and culture, and philanthropy and community services. To add on, Dr. Mustafa was also a former Fulbright Fellow at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Washington, DC, and received his PhD in International Relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He is a regional specialist on maritime Southeast Asia and keeps a close watch on developments in India and China. I shall now pass the session to Dr. Mustafa. Doctor, please. Thank you very much, Ashif, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, my research findings of uh, the journey I've had as a Lee Kong Chen Research Fellow with the National Library Board, Singapore. I'd like to begin by thanking National Library Board for the opportunity to carry out this research. Um, the team that has put this, put to this uh, seminar together, as well as those that have helped me throughout the journey in coming up with this project. Now, uh, I must begin by saying that I am not an expert on Gujaratis. Uh, I, I am carried out this research more out of my personal interest, uh, as I am a Gujarati myself. My great-grandfather from my mother's side came to Singapore in the 1930s. My grandfather from my father's side came here in the 1950s. So I've been, uh, been in Singapore for, for many decades. Uh, and and uh, specifically, I belong to the Daudi Bora community in Singapore. And uh, so that's why this is where the interest in Gujaratis really came out of. So I'm going to share a snapshot of my findings uh, for about 30 to 40 minutes. And I do want to keep a bit of time uh, for engagement, uh, questions that you may have. This is a Friday evening, so I really want to thank all of you for joining me. And you know, you're looking forward to the weekend. I, I do hope to make to this presentation somewhat insightful and enlightening. Uh, some of the information may be illuminating, but some of them may be information that you've already heard. So with, if, you, if you have, uh, please bear with me. So hopefully it will be, it will be, a, it will be a presentation that uh, you find to be useful today. So let me begin by asking a very fundamental question. Uh, what is a Gujarati? Uh, I, I think even that, even this question is not always very easy to answer. But I suppose at the most fundamental, at the more at the most basic or fundamental level, I think you could say that it is an it is some it is somewhat linked to the state of Gujarat. Right? So you're a native, you're an inhabitant, you have blue roots, you have a lineage in Gujarat, Western India, India. But the complexity also arises because Gujarat historically also very different jurisdictions. Uh, and in part, I think for 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 much of the British colonial period under the Bombay presidency, later Bombay state before the 1960s, before you saw a split, Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Gujarat also engulfing the peninsula area as well, where many of them were Gujarati speaking. Uh, so even geographically, historically, in terms of history, it's not always easy to pinpoint that this is where Gujarat was, but we generally knew that there was a state of Gujarat where there were people who spoke the Gujarati language, and also taking into account the, var the variations and dialects, Diverse Gujarati customs, traditions, often defined by faith, which I will talk about in subsequent slides. And I think for Gujaratis, for from the very beginning, I think it has been synonymous with mercantilism, with trading. So they were a community of traders. And because they were part of this Bombay presidency, Bombay state, even the diasporas, they were often also known as Bombay merchants. Or in this part of the world, also what's called Kadai Bombay, Bombay. Kadai basically has been shot by essentially what it means a Bombay businessman. And also, I think if you look at Gujaratis outside of India, in the diasporas, 
you can see somewhat of a dilution of the identity. When I say dilution, I don't necessarily mean it in a negative sense. It's just that the identity has morphed as you as Gujaratis have moved out of India to the diasporas in other parts of the world, what you call an external migration. So I think it then became this idea of self-identifiable Gujaratis. Do you identify yourself to be a Gujarati? Now, some have said that perhaps you can recognize them by surnames. To some extent, you can. Uh, I mean, there is a variety of names, uh, names, uh, you know, Hindus have Hindu, Hindu Gujaratis, Muslim Gujaratis, you have Desai, Parik, Patel, um, you know, and then you have many with Walas as well. Now, I'm not saying all Walas are Gujaratis, but you can see many of the Walas do have, do are Gujaratis as well. And some of them have uh, very unique names. Um, some of you may have heard Soda Bota, Soda, Soda Bota Opener Wala. Uh, that's one very long one. Uh, and there are others who have a surname linked to where they came from or linked to a business that they did. So in my case, my, my father's, my father's side, known as Sari Wala. So at some point, my great grandfather was trading in textiles, so saris. On my uh, my mother's side, uh, surname was Dahod Wala. So Dahod being a, a town in a town city in in Gujarat, and that's where my mother's side came from. So sometimes with the surnames, it's meant to either be linked to some kind of business or perhaps where they came from. So I think in the end, because of the difficulty. It's something defining what a Gujarati is, a Gujarati is. You take a sort of a constructivist approach and say that Gujarati is what you make of it, perhaps. Do you identify yourself as a Gujarati? Or do others identify you as a Gujarati? So I think it's, it's sort of a question that I think it's worth asking. But I think at the, I suppose, overall, I think we can describe Gujaratis as being diverse, being heterogeneous, being eclectic, and also, very importantly, being enterprising. Just some facts and figures. I mean, there are competing accounts of when exactly did the Gujarati migrate to this part of the world, Southeast Asia, and in particular, we're talking about Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. But there are accounts of going as far back as the 15th uh, to 17th, 15th century, 15th, 17th, 18th centuries. But I think if you look at some of the more concrete accounts, I, I think you could make the argument that the critical mass of the Gujaratis uh, really, you could say it's from the mid to late 19th century onwards. So we are looking at the 1850s, 1880s onwards. And of course, there was an influx of Gujaratis, particularly in the early 1900s and after the First World War in the 1920s onwards. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the heterogeneity of Gujaratis in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And one indicator of the heterogeneity are through the faith, right? So you have uh, Muslims, Gujarati Muslims, who are also further divided into Sunnis and Shias. Um, Hindus, Jains, Parsis, and also there are Christians as well, although very small in number. And of course, those who are not so religious or they subscribe to no faith. Now, the early migration from, came from different parts of Gujarat, uh, to this part of the world from different parts of Gujarat and the surrounding Gujarat as well. As a Kutch district, Katiawar Peninsula, Surat, Daud, Randir, Jaipur. And also, you also see an internal migration where Gujaratis moved away from Gujarat to neighboring Gujarat. So uh, states such as Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and also further afield, all the way to you know, the Bengal area, further down to southern part of uh, India before they moved out of India as well. Right? So an internal migration before the external migration took place. Now, uh, it is also very difficult, I must say at the outset, to be absolutely accurate on the number of Gujaratis that, I, that, that exists in, in any of these countries. So it's really a very much an estimate of looking at individual communities and having as accurate number for each of those communities and then, com and then uh, totaling them up. I think most of the Gujaratis, I think uh, with some of the studies that have been done is that they reside mostly in Malaysia, around 30,000 of them and an estimate followed by Singapore around 10,000 or so. And then Indonesia, less than 5,000 or so. And Singapore, less than about 10,000 or so. All right. I mean, it's again very, uh, very esti estimated figure. So I would be very cautious in saying this is really the numbers. But this is just to give you an idea of perhaps the, the size of the Gujaratis to an extent and also uh, uh, the size of them in each of these countries. I thought coming up with a conceptual framework, I actually did talk about it in the 
in the introduction about how I'm going to make, a, make this presentation. I think one easy way to sort of understand the Gujaratis is uh, through a number of interrelated intertwined networks, right? I think uh, topmost is really economic, business and trade. So I mentioned they are an enterprising community. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is in their DNA, it is in their blood to do business, to do trade. And also they very much, because they were successful, uh, you know, they, they strike it, they strike, they strike it rich to an extent. They were also philanthropists, they contributed as, a, as philanthropists and also towards community service, as well as in political and diplomatic service, which I will talk about in subsequent slides. There's also the religious imperative, and particularly with the Muslims being the majority in, 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 in Singapore, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost, which I'll be talking about a little bit in, in the subsequent slides as well. And also sports diplomacy, they were very much into sports, very healthy, very fit. Uh, and also they have a rich culture, cultural heritage, which I will also uh, address in my slides. Now, apart from the conceptual framework, it's also good to situate the conceptual framework within different phases of Gujarati migration. Now, the Gujarati migration does not, uh, it's not, it's not unique to the Gujaratis. I mean, you can extrapolate that to the wider Indian migration that have taken place uh, to this part of the world. Uh, one way, as I mentioned earlier, if we take the point of departure from the mid to late uh, 19th century onwards, so we look at 1850s, 1880s, so that you could say that is probably the first wave of uh, Indian Gujarati migration to Singapore. I would say more Gujarati than Indian, Gujarati migration to Singapore, all the way to up to the, you know, during the First World War, 1914, 1918. So they were there around that time. And then that's one, one phase that you can, I think, put a, uh, put a put a put a stop in and then you look at a, another phase now many of them came here as traders as merchants some of them came here without actually having a business back in india they came here actually to work in a firm that exists and then and then started on their own so it's very very common for for many gujaratis to come here to work for an existing firm before setting up their own firm others already had firms back in india and then they came here was to expand expand their business. Now, the second phase is from 1920 to 1940s onwards. I spoke about earlier about the influx of Gujaratis from the 1920s onwards, all the way to up to the uh, onset of the, of the Second World War, and particularly before the Japanese occupation. All right. Again, in this phase, most of them were traders, merchants, or aspiring traders or merchants. Then, of course, even during the Japanese occupation, you had Gujaratis who remained in Singapore, in Malaya, in, in Indonesia. And also you had uh, Gujaratis who fled and you also had Gujaratis who perished. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about what their life was in Japanese occupation if I have the time. The, third, the fourth phase is 1950s, 1990s. In fact, the majority of the Gujaratis that have been here for decades who trace their, their lineage or their, their, their migration to, to this part of the world in this particular phase from 1950 to 1990. And then you have 1990, 2010, where I think you have a change in the, the, the composition of Gujaratis coming here. Uh, they were more professionals, of course, riding on the, IC, uh, the ICT, the finance sector. And I think many of them in that particular phase have also become naturalized. So they become part of the Singapore society. And now I think we are living the 2010 to the present phase. And I think from this particular phase, many of them are more transient uh, uh, rather than, uh, and of course, some of them have aspirations of staying in Singapore, but it has become a more of a transient Gujarati migration to this part of the world. Now, I shall begin with the most obvious that is economic business and trade. Now, there is this term Wohra or Wohra, which in Gujarati means to trade. Uh, that's why I do I emphasize earlier that it is in their blood, it is in their DNA to be traders, to be merchants. Now, I must also mention here that this part of the world, what we call East Asia and then Southeast Asia, were not the only migration that the Gujaratis did. Uh, earlier than coming to this part of the world, they had actually ventured out to the eastern part of Africa in particular, uh, and, 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 and also in the Indian Ocean. So, uh, so um, just to say that we are not the only, we are not solely the migration of Gujaratis to this part, the outside of India. 
Gujaratis have also ventured elsewhere. But the point here is that it is part, as I mentioned earlier, it's part of their DNA, part of their culture, part of their blood to trade. Now, very much in, involved in the import-export trade, trading a variety of goods just to give you, uh, you know, a list of some of the goods and commodities that they traded in uh, from the very beginning and for much of, the, of their history. And today, perhaps some of them are still good, are still, in, still um, you know, trading in some of these goods that are outlined there, but they've also ventured into IT, finance, logistics, travel agencies, et cetera. Right? Now, uh, it has been predominantly family owned they acted as middlemen, they capitalized on Singapore's free port status, geographical location along the Silk Road, and even the Indian Ocean specifically, including the Bay of Bengal. Now, the significant presence of the enterprising Gujaratis in Singapore, right, of which the Gujarati Muslims, of course, were prominent as particularly, led to the HSBC issuing street settlement bank note that featured the Gujarati language inscription on it. Right? Now, uh, there's also the Basrai Brothers in the Likwani Memos, which I will talk about in a minute. Well, it's a very interesting story that some of you may, may know. Now, uh, just to continue with this particular network, uh, they were in, in these areas. I've just outlined them, Malacca Street, Market Street, and, you know, and, and the rest. Now, oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, they were known as Bombay Merchants or Kadai Bombay because Gujarat is part of that present Bombay Presidency or State before it was divided. Now, what is also interesting in Arab Street, Right? Despite being known as Arab Street, the business things, the businesses that made a lot of money in that part of the street were actually Gujaratis right? for much of the colonial period. And in particular, the Gujarati Hindus and Muslims who traded in textiles. And you see cases of Gujarati Hindus and Muslims actually working together in the textile business as well at the Arab Street area. Where you have Gujarati Hindu firms employing Gujarati Muslims working for them. And some of them even got getting into partnership uh, in the textile trade. There were also profitable businesses at shop houses in Sambawang area, particularly in Transit Road. And they benefited from the presence of the British at the nearby, nearby naval base. Now, because they were very much into business and trade, they were very, they were, the Gujaratis were heavily involved in the setting up of business organizations. Right? At the very beginning, you had the Indian Merchants Association, and then there was evolution to the Indian Chamber of Commerce, the Indian Chamber of Commerce, and now what you have today, the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And every step of the evolution of the, of the business organization, in this case, talking about Singapore, uh, the, the Gujaratis had played an important role. They played pivotal role, include, including uh, being uh, in precedence of the organizations, of these uh, business associations. Now, of course, apart from the business association, you also have very specific uh, Indian business uh, organizations that Gujaratis were a part of, for example, in, in timber, in spice, even in uh, in money, in, even in to do with uh, money lending to some extent, some of them were doing that as well. All right. Um, so they were involved in many of the sort of very specific business interest organizations as well. Now, uh, this is just to show you the, the background I was talking about earlier. Uh, if you could see where on the right side is actually the Gujarati inscription. Uh, and, I, and I understand it is actually, it, it just says $10. Now, so so that, that's, that's the bank loan that the HSBC issued. And it's just is to reflect at that point, the Gujaratis who were you know, very prominent in their presence uh, in the street settlements in particular. So we're talking about Penang, Malacca, uh, and Singapore. Now, uh, the one on the right side is quite interesting uh, about this chap uh, known as Kasim Mansur. Now, um, some of you familiar in Singapore's history, there was a 1915 Indian mutiny. And one of the, uh, one of the individuals that was hanged was, by, was the name of Kasim Mansur. Now, uh, many people know that he was an Indian, but uh, few people know that he was actually not just an Indian, but a Gujarati. Uh, he came from, uh, he, was, he was called Mansur or Mansuri or Pinjar, Pinjara, so, which is which is, um, very much into cotton textiles and all that from, uh, from, from Gujarat. Uh, so he had moved here, very wealthy, uh, had properties, had a coffee shop. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, like sentenced uh, to death for treason. Right? As he was, obviously, uh, they believe to be involved in a conspiracy against the British during the Eden Mutiny period in 1915. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, recorded in the, 
uh, in the archives. So you can, of course, uh, read up more about him. Now, these are just a couple more pictures. Uh, it's available in the National Archives. On the left side is, is actually the Indian Chamber of Commerce meeting that was held. Uh, many of the Gujaratis were involved uh, in, in this meeting and in the setting up of the organization as the, as the business association got larger. Uh, also interesting is what they were wearing at that time. Um, and also on the right side, it's uh, it's it's actually the Gujarati many Indians, but including the Gujaratis welcoming uh, uh, Pandit Nehru, Jawal Nehru, when he visited Singapore. I believe this was somewhere perhaps in the 1930s. Now I spoke of the Basra brothers earlier. Now if you look at Lee Kuan Yew's memoirs, he mentions Basra brothers. Uh, now Basra brothers were uh, stationers. Uh, you know, uh, business, they were, they were doing business in stationery. Now, it was mentioned in his memoirs, and it was mentioned because of, uh, it all started with this idea of improvisation. This is during the Japanese occupation, the Basra brothers approached and said, we need stationery gum. So the, the, the point here was more about how do you improvise during a time of crisis? But the, the subtext here as well, if you like, or an additional point, would be as he went about improvising and trying to come up with stationary gum, he had the opportunity to meet what became his future wife, right? At, at, the, at the, where she was staying. So the point here is that because of what Basra brothers had asked Lee Kuan Yew to do at that time, it got him the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to meet his future wife more, uh, more regularly. Uh, so I suppose you could say, uh, with a somewhat of an exaggeration, that the Gujaratis had a part to play in bringing Lee Kuan Yew and his future wife together and perhaps changing the course of history in Singapore. <laughs> now, the right side is just to show you that the, the dissolution of the Basrai brothers after they have been uh, trading in Singapore for quite a while. Now, uh, the other network I think is important, and I mentioned as as a wealthy businessman, you know, as they amassed a fortune, they were also, you know, a notable philanthropist and they contributed to community service as well. Now, if you look at the newspaper SG, which is, uh, you know, uh, managed by National Library Board, it's an exceptional and amazing resource to look back at what some of the contributions of the communities have done, uh, the various communities of Singapore has, have done. And if you look at newspaper SG, you see, if you type in some of the notable Gujarati firms, you can see that they have been contributing to various funds linked to the British, particularly in the British colonial period, right? And also the period when, uh, when Singapore was under the Japanese occupation. At that time, they were known as the Sayonan, uh, you know, bracket Gujarati Indians, right? And of course, during that time, uh, Gujaratis who were here, they also contributed to the Indian Independence League as well as the Indian, Indian National Army. Um, they were not so much involved in the fighting, but I think they were more in, they were involved in it uh, to some extent because they really, you know, they, they, they were keen in getting independence to India to an extent, but I think more about protecting their business interest, right? Uh, so being involved in, in, you know, being, being involved in the IIL and Indian National Army and particularly having close relations with Subhachandra Bose at that time, it helped them to you know, shield their businesses as Subhachandra Bose had a, you know, had, uh, had, had a good relationship with the Japanese at that time. So, let, so with that, the Japanese would leave the Gujarati businesses alone. That was the idea. Now, um, they have also set up charitable foundations and funds, and this is just, just to list up some of the funds and foundations there are. Um, you have got the Gujarati Hindus, the Parsis, the Muslims. So many of them have set up these funds and, uh, and foundations which have helped, uh, you know, people from the most vulnerable, right, uh, to the less fortunate so, and the needy. So, you know, it, it, they're good that, you know, as they amassed, uh, my, uh, you know, a fortune, they have set up foundations to help others. Now, they also played pivotal roles in Indian Malay organizations. Uh, even till today, various NGOs, whether you talk about the Rotary, Rotary Club, Lions Club, and also at the national and many national agencies as well, right? So although they were Gujarati speaking, they were also involved in Malay organizations, and 
and, and, and there's a reason for that, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, why would Indian Gujarati be involved in Malay organizations? There's a reason for that. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Now, um, so there were, and also notable contributor of Gujarati Muslims, I think the development and of and uplifting of the Muslim community in Singapore. So you see many of the Gujarati, the Gujarati Muslims contributing to various Muslim organizations throughout history and also being involved in, uh, in an advisory or decision-making capacity uh, when there was the Muslim Mohammedan Advisory Board, Muslim Advisory Board, and later subsequently with the setting up of the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore uh, with the passing of AMLA, yes, the administration of the Muslim Act. Right? Um, now, they were also involved in political service, particularly in pre-independent Singapore. Uh, they ran in city legislative elections. Uh, they were elected. Uh, three, three, or, three or four of them were elected. Um, and also one of them rose to, to the level of the Minister of Commerce and Industry in the David Marshall cabinet. So we're talking about pre-independent, pre-1965 Singapore. They've also reached the upper echelons of the civil service and diplomatic service. Some of them are serving as non-resident ambassadors or have served as non-resident ambassadors of Singapore. Now, this is just to give you, uh, you know, what I was talking about earlier. So on the left side is what I took off the newspaper as your website. So you can see that on newspaper SG search engine, you can see some of the, you know, the business firms there, which uh, may ring a bell. So all the way you can see Poshatam Das, which is a Gujarati firm, Isabai, Motivalas, and several others there as well. On the right side is just to show you that during the Japanese occupation, they were also giving donations, right? Uh, so one was the Nippon Red Cross. They were able to accumulate, collect 12,000. Um, Twelve thousand dollars. I think it was a different currency at that time, but I think it was in Sayonan currency. I think. All right. The other is, of course, in sports. Now, for the Gujaratis, they very much what we call cricket obsession. Uh, I, by obsession, I mean in a more in a very positive sense, right? So involved in many of the clubs that were that were around at that time and also today, uh, both in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and often they would have competitions particularly between Malaya and Singapore, right? And, um, and some of them played, played more competitively, others for more for leisure purposes, all right? Um, what was just interesting, there was something called the Bombay Sports Club in the 1930s, the early 90s, for a very short period, uh, but it was mentioned in the archives. So it just tells you that, you know, how sporting the Gujaratis were. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the Gujaratis were known as Bombay merchants at that time. Now, so if you look at the committee forming the Bombay Sports Club, many of them are Gujaratis. Now, beyond cricket, of course, there are also uh, Gujaratis interested in equestrian polo, particularly in Singapore Polo Club, and also the Malaysian Polo Association. There were competition between Malaysia and Singapore. And of course, later, hockey, tennis, football. Uh, football, of course, has a long history as well. But I, meant, I, mean, I use the word localizing in a very loose sense, in the sense that they, they, were, they were less interested in cricket and more interested in football in this part of the world. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that they there were also a wide array of sports that interested the Gujaratis uh, in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Now, just just to show you two again from the uh, from newspaper SG, uh, there were Gandhi cricket matches. Oh, Gandhi, of course, being from Gujarat as well, and of course uh, the bowling. I talk about the Bombay Sports Club. This is just show you what kind of uh, matches they were having at that time as well. Many of them friendly, competitive matches. Now, just to go to the cultural heritage now. Now, uh, cultural heritage is actually very difficult to put everything together because it's so rich, it's diverse. Uh, but I just to kind of lay out in a very abstract way, I'm happy to elaborate if you have questions on it. I think first is of course language. I think if you look at language, of course you would think it is Gujarati as the language. Um, we do have a Singapore Gujarati school. Uh, so that in itself suggests that there is a demand or an interest in speaking the Gujarati language. Uh, of course, this happened, and I mean, it's been around for a while, but as far as making a second language is concerned, it was really for the post 1990s onwards, the non Tamil Indian language policy. Now, pre 1990s onwards, uh, the second language for many of the Gujaratis were, was Malay uh, instead of Gujarati. Gujarati was something they either spoke at home or perhaps at a place of worship. But uh, you know they, they were mostly Malay speaking, and also because where they grew up in the Kampong area, some of them of course also took Mandarin, but majority had taken Malay. And uh, 
and Malay. Yeah. So just the, the language itself is also part of the culture of the Gujaratis here in Singapore. Also uh, being able to, uh, to learn up a range of languages. So you see, so you have some Gujaratis who may be trilingual. So they know English, Malay and Gujarati or some variation of Gujarati. Of course, the food cuisine of Gujaratis, uh, we cannot uh, not talk about it. Uh, there's a mix, there's, there's a savory part, there's a sweet part. Although I'm a Gujarati, I'm not a very sweet person. Um, I, mean, I mean that by the food. Um, but it's, it's something synonymous with, uh, with Gujarati and also with Gujaratis here in this part of the world and in this case in Singapore. Um, I suppose pan is still available here in Singapore, but I think it was more of a culture in the past. I think uh, my grandparents, uh, my great grandparents, they, I mean, they, they loved a pan, like right, chewing the betel leaves. And they still do that back in, in India, in Gujarat, and also elsewhere, outside of Gujarat as well. Of course, the food is also influenced by vegetarianism. As you know, majority of uh, you know, Gujaratis, I'm talking about the state of Gujarat, are Hindus, Jains. So when they come to this part of the world, food also bring that food dietary, uh, dietary restrictions to this part of the world. So the faith also defines the way, the, the kind of food that they have. Uh, and also, of course, being here for several decades, there's a localization of the Gujarati food uh, with the more local taste. There's fusion of Gujarati food as well. So there is those, and you still, so in other words, you still have your traditional Gujarati food, but you also have fusion Gujarati food uh, that's available. I mean, that's being cooked in households, for example. Also, it depends on the generational preferences, the older generation, the younger generation, and also when did you arrive uh, in Singapore as well, right? So perhaps the more, the, you know, earlier generation to, a, to the, the ones who have been around for decades and those perhaps arrived in the last uh, 10, 20 years, for example. Of course, attire is also something we have to talk about when we talk about Gujaratis. I mean, very much, you know, still Gujaratis who hold on to the Indian fashion. And there's a whole range of Indian fashion as well, all right, from saris, Punjabis, so on and so forth. Some prefer Western fashion. It really depends on the generational uh, preferences, interest. There's fusion fashion as well. And you also have attire going to places of worship like for the Parsis, they're a very unique attire. Uh, for Sunni Muslims, uh, many of them, the Gujarati Muslims or Sunni Muslims, usually wear what generally most other Muslims wear. Uh, Shia Muslims, depending. Um, so you have the Bohras, uh, who have a certain attire of white, which, which, has, a, which has a topi, which has a white and a gold rim, uh, uh, you know, sort of a mix of the two. Um, you also have those who perhaps wear more, more of the traditional, sort of more Pakistani kind of attire. And so it's just also a kind of a mix. So, uh, so attire itself also shows the heterogeneity that exists. Of course, there's a range of festivals as well, both cultural, religious. It's just to give you a snapshot of some of the festivals that are practiced by the Gujaratis. Dance music, Dandia, Garba, are some of the dance music, you can read up more on that. Now, um, marriages is also quite interesting. Now, some Gujaratis prefer endogamous marriages, so within the community. Others, there have been intermarriages. Now, the intermarriages have had the effect, uh, this is not to say it's positive or negative, but just to have an effect of saying that perhaps they are, they are becoming less Gujarati and more in terms of perhaps uh, a Gujarati marrying a Malay, a Gujarati mar marrying another Indian ethnicity. So you see a sort of over time, uh, a sort of a, a fusion of identities, perhaps. So perhaps one identity being being more uh, dominant than the other. All right. So we, we see that as, as having an impact on the Gujarati identity uh, in Singapore. Now, this is just to list down some of the Gujarati linked organization and networks. So you just if you could just sort of look through the list, you can see that there are organizations that are more religious based, there are organizations that are more cultural based, uh, and some of them perhaps more, uh, I suppose, you know, the Singapore Gujarati School, actually, I've just put it down, more educational. Right? But essentially, if you like, uh, a mix of cultural and religious, you have both the sort of Gujarati linked organizations and networks in Singapore. There's also the Singapore Indian Association established in 1923, but not confined to the Gujaratis, so the pioneer leaders were Gujaratis. Now, just to move very quickly to Gujaratis in Malaysia. Now, many of the things I mentioned in the Gujaratis of Singapore do apply to Malaysia or Malay at that time and, and Indonesia as well, in terms of the kind of trading that they were doing. So even in, uh, in Malaya, Malaysia, and Indonesia, or at that time was also known as the East Indies, they were very, uh, the Dutch East Indies, they, they were very much 
uh, uh, you know, dealing in import export trade, and particularly in textiles, right? Uh, in in, uh, in Malaysia as well as in Indonesia. Now, just to give you an idea where they were, uh, as I mentioned earlier, straight settlements were really where they had uh, ventured to Malacca and particularly Penang, and also other coastal cities right, such as Klang in the state of uh, Selangor, and also subsequently migration, internal migration within Malaysia as well to other parts of uh, Malaysia, particularly after its independence. Now, this is some, again a, a sort of a list of organization and networks that you may be able to find in Malaysia that have some link to Gujaratis. Again, some, again, mix of of culture, religion, as well as business. Right? You can see the Malaysian India Chamber of Commerce Industry, particularly in Penang, for example. You have the Shantinikan Shantinikatan Foundation Malaysia. It's very much that is a Jain uh, foundation. Uh, you have Jain temples in Ipoh and Kuala Lumpur as well. Right? Just to give you a now, uh, talking about Malaya, Malaysia at that time, I thought of just talking about one individual, uh, which is quite famous in, 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 uh, in Malaysia, even till today, is the Abdul Qadir family. Now, the person on the left is Sir Hussein Hassanari Abdul Qadir, very prominent, the, uh, as you can see by the headline, the Malaya's first Indian knight. Right? Uh, so he has a history, his, his history is quite interesting. He actually started in Singapore, which we see in the middle that particular uh, article in the in the Straits Times, you can see his father came here, actually came to Singapore first before moving to Penang, right? And then in Penang is where his, uh, his, his son, Sir Hussein Hassan Ali Abdul Qadir, made his mark, right? Uh, he was so uh, famous that he has a, a, a road named after him. Uh, we still exist today, all right? Um, on the uh, top, on the bottom right there, is, uh, is the son of Sir Hussein Hassani Abdul Qadir, known as Yusuf Abdul Qadir. It's a book that has been written for both of them uh, that have been published in Malaysia. Uh, Yusuf Abdul Qadir also, as you can see by the title there, a uh, very famous uh, legal, a legal lion, so a very famous lawyer, a judge. All right? uh, and, and, and what was interesting there in the, in the, in the book that's written about him is that he was one of the, one of the, more, one of the youngest students to have enrolled in Raffles College, Raffles Institution at that time. And the interesting part there is that he was bullied uh, during that time because he was one of the youngest students by the, the senior students who were there. And one of the senior students who bullied and wrecked him, allegedly wrecked him based on his memoirs was uh, Lee Kuan Yew. All right, okay. Now, Gujarati of Indonesia. Now, uh, similar to, to Malaysia, it, it's similar to Malaysia and well, Singapore is Singapore, but if you look at Malaysia, Indonesia, or Malaya at that time, you can see many of the Gujaratis venturing to coastal ports or coastal cities, or port cities, because this is where they can do trade, uh, you know, easily, smoothly, and extensively. So similarly in Indonesia, the early Gujaratis made their way to Surabaya, Makassar, Palu, and Bali. So Bali is where you can see many of the Gujaratis residing today. And they also reside in other parts of Indonesia, depending on the kind of business that they have, or they are even or they are professionals, right? In Jakarta as we, and, and elsewhere in, in Indonesia. Again, a snapshot of some of the organization and networks as they organize themselves, right? There is the Yayasan Daudi Bora in Bali, there's the Daudi Bora Mosque there. It's also very interesting the world the Memon organization. Now, the Memons are Gujaratis, uh, they are Sunni Gujaratis, uh, and particularly uh, subscribing to the Hanafi School of Thought. Uh, so they have the World Memon Organization try and bring the memons of the world together and they have an Indonesia chapter. They have a, they have a, 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 a newsletter that they have published, uh, which if you Google Memon Indonesia, you'll be able to access it. And you can have a very rich history as well to Indonesia. And they came here, they were also known as Sugar Kings uh, in Indonesia. If you look at that particular newsletter that was written, uh, that was published. Uh, as you can see here, also a mix of uh, religious and cultural groups as well. Okay. Now, this is just the, the, the newsletter I was referring to. Okay, uh, before I end, I uh, just wanted to say a little bit about Gujaratis now going forward. Uh, what are Gujaratis like today and what does this, all these research findings actually mean? I think it is significant to do such a, such, a, such a research project because I think we need to know a lot more about the, uh, the variety or the diversity of communities that exist in Singapore, in Malaysia, and in Indonesia, about the, the history 
of how they came here, the migratory history of how they came here, what kind of uh, uh, what kind you know, what kind of life they were living here, what kind of businesses, what kind of professions they were in, uh, you know, how did they preserve their identity? How have their identities evolved over time? And how are they continuing to contribute to the countries of their origin, uh, countries of their residence today? Right, whether it's in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, um, and also very interesting is how have they localized or they have um, sort of uh, become a very integral part of the social fabric or the multicultural, um, you know, fabric of, uh, of of the countries that uh, that they, they, they now reside in. All right. So I think going forward, the Gujaratis will continue to play an important role. Uh, I think the, the Gujaratis today, of course, are a mix of those who have been around uh, for, for various decades and also those who have uh, arrived more recently. And I think the dynamism between um, the, the dynamism, dynamism of those communities of different phases of migration and, of course, of different uh, faith communities, different cultural communities that make up Gujaratis and the amalgamation of this Gujaratis is really the strength of the Gujaratis in this part of the world. And this is where I think they will continue to contribute and enrich um, the, the countries that they reside in. So I think on that note, I will stop here and thank you very much. And I look forward to your uh, queries and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Mustafa.